You know, college sports, money's going up all the time. Crazy. It's recession proof. It is COVID proof. Yeah. Money goes up, salaries go up. You know, coaches driving a Cadillac while all American linebackers start. The yeah. first school you mentioned was who? Alabama. <laughs> So what if Alabama got the best recruits? Is that what yeah. you're asking? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They already did. <laughs> what if they won the natty every yeah. year? <laughs> and our counter was, well, that means you're robbing players right yeah. now. All right, here's my question. NCAA video game. <laughs> <laughs> when are we getting it back? <laughs> yeah. That's why I said, yeah, that's the claim. Football and basketball pays for everything. Well, if you need fo big football and basketball money to fund other sports, then how does Division II exist? Across the 30 to the 40. He's able to fend off the defender and bring in the game's first touchdown. Yeah, so what is that podcast called? It's called like Momentum. Right. Mogi, the haters were saying that the black tie with the blue suit wasn't a good look. Oh, man. <laughs> Including really? Matt. Yeah. <laughs> you just went without um, the tie. You said, so, I didn't think so. I just woke up and wanted to prove everyone wrong. <laughs> hey, there you go. You guys look sharp. You're all good. Yeah. You're all I, good. I Appreciate said it's it. being a trendsetter, and this guy's a follower over here. He said, uh, I just said it broke the fashion rules. I don't know. Is it, though? I think people Navy do that. In black? No. You know what? You guys are a lot younger than me, so I, I, I'm not a, <laughs> I know I can't talk fashion on you. But you look well, good. You, you look good as well, you man. You look great. That the the off blues. I like the vibe, man. I appreciate that. That's I can't take any credit. That's the wife. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she got you right. That's it. You know, she she picks stuff out. She says, "How about this today?" I said, "Thank you." That's yeah. all I say. Is thank you. <laughs> awesome. All right, let's get into it. We were talking, or we've. Shoes? Yeah, yeah. Well, everyone knows who Ramogi yeah, is. Ramogi's yeah. the man. Um, you've been um at the forefront of student athletes' rights. Yeah, man. We've been talking for for years about this kind of stuff, and most recently. The new bill that Senator Bradford is co-authoring, right, and that you're a proponent of as well. Um, and there was a big movement forward on Wednesday. Is, was that correct? Yeah, there was a big, it was a vote in the Judiciary Committee. Um, so in California, depending on what the bill has in it, uh, it gets referred to different committees. The Judiciary looks at the legal aspects. And uh, fortunately, we got the vote, 9 to 1, uh, due pass. Still has a number of hurdles to pass, but um, I, think, awesome. I think it's passed two key committees now. First, the Senate Education Committee, now the Judiciary. So this definitely has some momentum. Absolutely. That's and awesome. can you explain what the bill is as well? Sure. So it's a bill that would ensure that California college athletes receive fair market value. Right now, under NCAA sports, all the colleges in the NCAA, they illegally collude. They get together and make agreements to fix the price or cost of players' scholarships and compensation um, at a fixed rate, which is against the law it violates antitrust laws. So California right now is considering um, making sure that college athletes receive 50% of their revenue, which is market value. You look at the pros, right? All the pro contracts, um, the union agreements, it's pretty much 50% of revenue goes to the players. Yeah. And this here is a $15 billion a year commercial enterprise where, you know, it's a fraction of that going to the players. So California is looking to kind of uh, adjust things and make things more fair. That's awesome. And the main concern from what I understood from administrators is that with Title IX, because football and basketball largely fund the other sports. Well, in a sense, that's the, that's the statement. Yeah. yeah. And so they're arguing that, in essence, if, if you did that 50-50 revenue share with the football and basketball players, then the other sports would die. Yeah, so they've been, they've been threatening that for quite some time. They threatened yeah. that when we fought. We talked a little bit ago about scholarships. When I played uh, the scholarships, a so-called full scholarship, mm -hmm. fell short of the price tag of the school, which was the cost of attendance. So... <laughs> It was pretty deceptive. You thought you were on a full scholarship, but we were short about three to $5,000 per player per year. And we fought for that. We had to fight for that. And it wasn't until the O'Bannon lawsuit um, victory that finally the, the court said, no, you can't cap full scholarships below the cost of attendance. Um, but prior to that, the school said the same thing. Oh, Lord, if we, if we pay three to $5,000 per player per year, we have to cut all the other sports. Mm. In the meantime, you look at the, the revenue that they're reporting by law to the Department of Education over the last 15 years. And even the smaller revenue schools. So if you take California, if you forget, forget the, big, the bigger revenue schools, FBS division, you take the rest of the Division I uh, sports, those colleges have tripled their money from $80 million to about $250 million over this time period. Um, did they add sports? No. Yeah. And actually, the number of athletes actually went down by over 1,000 athletes. Really? And coaches' salaries shot up. 
facilities expenditures shot up. The number of coaches for fewer athletes shot up. Yeah. So it's been a lot of uh, talk. The, the truth is that these sports have been paid for long ago. That's why I said, yeah, that's the claim. Football and basketball pays for everything. Well, if you need fo big football and basketball money to fund other sports, then how does Division Two exist? Mm. Yeah. There is no football and basketball money in Division Two. That's right? true. Yeah. They spend less. They don't spend four to eleven million dollars on coaches, and they don't, you know, pay for lazy rivers in the athletic department <laughs> and things like that. Literally, that's like Clemson. They got a lazy yeah. river. Clemson right? does have a lazy they river. They have a slide. I mean, yeah. they have some crazy stuff. Yeah. You know, I talked to the players at Clemson. They kind of yeah. laughed about it, but at the same time, for the administration and you know schools to be saying, "Oh, we're going to have to cut these other sports." They don't have to cut other sports. They have plenty of money. Um, but the bill is being amended for that purpose. Senator Bradford, um, he's having conversations about looking at exclusively the new money coming in. Because as I mentioned, you know, college sports, money's going up all the time. Crazy. It's recession proof. It is COVID proof. Yeah. Money goes up. Salaries go up. So we know there'll be new money coming in all the time. So he may be targeting that um, after amendments uh, to ensure and make people feel okay that all sports will be preserved. Yeah, you mentioned they were looking at doing an amendment with past 2018 profits. Is that is that the new amendment in the bill? Not quite. They're still kind of working it out. They okay. want to they're going to if they're going to look at new revenue, they're going to have to base it off of comparative revenue. So whether that be 2020, 2019, 2018, okay. Um, they'll have to be a year chosen and compared and said, "Look, any money on top of that is going to be uh, going exclusively to players for these purposes." So that's the type of thing they're looking into. Um, we're a sponsor of the bill. We help shape the bill. We're the primary advocate for the bill. Um, but we don't have all control. If we had all control of the bill, um, it'd be different. But as it goes through each committee, each committee, they assert what they want. Yeah. You know, um, and the senator wants as much as he can get for the players in a fair way. Um, and when it comes to Title IX, you know, that was something the school said, oh, will it violate Title IX? Nothing in the bill will violate Title IX. Title IX, uh, regardless of aggregate money going, if, if more go to men or women, the fact that it's based off of a non-discriminatory factor, 50% for players of all sports, it doesn't matter if you're men, if you're in men's sports, or women's sports, um, then that can comply with Title IX. Oh, I see. So you're so, saying yeah. 50 per, but so if tennis and swimming don't have any profit, they then, just don't make then they're just not making any money, you're saying? Correct, okay. correct. So for instance, like, like in California, there are, school, there are women's sports that would qualify. You know, mm, like UCLA like, tennis. It makes women's some money. really women's tennis. They'd probably get UConn basketball, girls basketball. Yeah, potentially, yeah, um, yeah. If it was applied out of state, so this, just to be clear, this bill only applies in California. Oh, mm. really? This okay. is just California, and the same way California shaped the NIL uh, reform. Yeah, this is what we're trying to. Because then people will follow you. So people, yeah, people will follow. So I, there, I, there's no way you can recruit out of state if California yeah. players can make revenue. Everyone's and, gonna come here. Yeah, yeah. it would be it would be madhouse. Yeah, we'll see a domino just like we saw. Name, image, likeness, domino across the, yeah. uh, across the nation. So it's really important to get the rate right. You know, um, 15 years ago, the NCAA could have thrown players a bone and said, you know what, we'll give 15%, you know, and people would have probably celebrated that. Yeah. <clears throat> but now, you know, we've we done our research. We see the numbers. We see how they're using the money, you know, where it's going and the revenue explosion. And it's, been, it's more apparent that this is, this is pro sports. You know, this is pro sports. Some of the college coaches are making – more than the professional yeah. coaches you know, are making. Yeah. So, that, and that's okay. You know, in America, sure. we all, I mean, regular students that you go to school with in college, why are they there? They want to go get pro education. or something, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. they want to. They want to get education, but yeah. for, to what end? Yeah, to go and work in a job and be good at whatever job they're, at, they're doing, you know? Right, make some money, yeah. be a professional. We're, we celebrate professionalism in this nation. You know, act like a professional. You know, that's something to be, that we all aspire to. But this industry has demonized that on yeah. the college level. And all it was is to monopolize the money. That's it. So that they can keep calling, labeling players amateurs, and meanwhile, stuff in their pockets. And that's what's been going on. But as I mentioned, it breaks a, actually a number of laws. Um, and so you know, we're able to put the facts and figures in front of the lawmakers in California. And so far, they've been responsive. That's awesome. And so how did you kind of get into this whole um, field and wanting to do this? And Yeah. yeah. Grudgingly, um, <laughs> <clears throat> so I, I used to play football at UCLA. Okay, um, awesome. And it wasn't long after I got to UCLA that I realized something was wrong with the system. I was, as you see right now, I, actually I was just speaking at Miami of Ohio yesterday, and uh, I asked them what position they thought I played, and they all said receiver. Yeah. You know, I was ready for a kicker or something like that. 
I, I was an inside linebacker. I could see oh, a receiver. Wow. Yeah, I could see. Yeah, yeah. receiver. Yeah. I was an inside linbacker, and I was undersized. So hitting, yeah. I was undersized, so I had to try to gain weight. Okay. So I went from high school trying to gain weight all these years. I went from eating five, six meals a day to showing up on campus at UCLA, um, and we only got three swipes of the meal card three times a day. Yeah. And I immediately started losing weight. Um, and not too long after that, the, the linebacker I was backing up, who was an All-American, uh, he was suspended by the NCAA. He was on a radio right. show. He was talking about how tough it was to get by. You know, as I mentioned, the scholarship, especially then, wasn't even designed to cover your expenses, but they told you it was full, right? So he was like, look, my scholarship trick has run out. <clears throat> I don't have any food in my refrigerator, and I don't know what I'm going to do. Someone left groceries on his doorstep. He never even knew about it, never took the groceries in, but somehow the NCAA found, about, out, out, they found out about it, and when they did, hmm. they suspended him. Interesting. Over food, you know, and this is, again, all-American linebacker. I walked by the student store to go into the meeting and find out he was suspended, but at the student store, they were selling his jersey. Yeah. You know, so really the NCAA, it was a violation of their NIL rules. Yeah. Right? You only got that food because of your athletics reputation. That's against our rules. You're an amateur. You should have starved. It's basically what it yeah. was, right? So that went, that went, and that came and went, uh, felt pretty helpless as a team. And then going into summer workouts, where we were highly encouraged to go to so-called voluntary workouts. Um, yeah. They're pretty much mandatory. Mandatory, right? yeah. 100%. Yeah. yeah, you're going to these workouts. If you want to see the field, yeah, you know, exactly. you're, you're going to these workouts, which was fine. But our NCAA compliance officer stood up in the same meeting when we did the orientation and said, look, by the way, if you get injured during these workouts, uh, the NCAA has a rule that prohibits us from paying for your medical expenses, so you're on your own. Well, really? And this is at the time. This Even on campus? Like if you're working out with them, you're working. On really? campus, structured by them, given the footballs, the wow. facilities, everything. Because it's technically voluntary, you're technically, saying? Technically, they called it voluntary, okay. right? But yeah. they're taking role. They know who's yeah. coming. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like one of those things. Wayne like, in. Oh, Wayne <laughs> yeah. in everything, right? <laughs> and, and so at the time, this was before Obamacare, okay? Okay. Plenty of people had no insurance whatsoever. Sure. And you're talking about a sport where schools heavily recruit from low-income black families. And you had a number of players saying, my parents don't, I don't have insurance. So if I go blow my knee out, it's on me? Yeah. The answer was, unfortunately, yes. Wow. So that's how it started. And at the time, I had played with some, um, you know, a lot of, I, we had a good high school football team. So we had guys go play Division One football in different schools. And I, you know, I talked to my teammates, talked to them, and said, look, we got to do something. We don't even yeah. have a voice here. We're, we're the talent in a, you know, this huge industry. You know, coaches driving a Cadillac while all-American linebackers starving. You know, and I've lost like 15 pounds, yeah. <laughs> you know, so they all agree. They're like, yeah, this is ridiculous. We're all in it. You know, so um, we started a student group on campus, which uh, sounds more impressive than it was. I mean, literally uh, three Bunch people, a mission statement. You could have yeah. started any group you wanted, just three people in <laughs> a mission statement. But we started a group. Um, Got to get the ball and rolling. Kind of went from there. Yeah. 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 Didn't know what we were doing, but we were frustrated what was going on. That's how it that's how it started. That reminds me of the, the Shabazz Napier or Napier deal, yeah. when he said he was going hungry. And actually soon thereafter, they, they kind of amended and changed the rules, right, with the training tables. And um, it's just crazy to think dudes didn't have access to meals like yeah. we do now. Like, like we kind of take it for granted, like all the things we have now. Like right now, you know, Little Galen's our athletic dining hall. Mm -hmm. Go in there almost anytime, anytime during That's the great. day. That's great. You know, full yeah. buffet, stipends, which didn't exist back then. We were talking about NIL, all this. And obviously I think there's a lot more to go. Right. Um, but to say we've gone this far is really impressive, and a lot of it is because of you, which is which is amazing. Well, you know, it's it's all been brick by brick, and it hasn't all just been me. It really, every, at every point, there were people that stood up. You mentioned Shabazz, Shabazz Napier, right? He yeah. stood up. Yeah. Donnie Edwards, he was the one who I was talking about, my uh, the linebacker who was suspended. He stood up. You know, yeah. he, he talked. The, he said the system's exploitative. This is wrong. Um, <clears throat> Ed O'Bannon, former player, he stood up. You know, he filed a lawsuit. And other, other current players had to join that lawsuit in, in order for that lawsuit to keep going. So each and every moment, what we've tried to do as an organization, what I've tried to do, is to create opportunities where players and current and former players have opportunities to step up and fight back. Yeah. You know, because it's, it's an important fight. We're talking about years. From when my teammate was suspended, 1995, Shabazz Napier, I think that was 2014. <laughs> 2014. Nothing changed. <laughs> Nothing had changed. Yeah. You know? Um, but at the time, you know, there was a big push. We tried to you know, unionize Northwestern football players to get some of these protections, and not all just economic, health and safety. You know, there's been players dying, um, athletes become, you know, being sexually assaulted, and 
you know, the NCAA is nowhere to be found. So there's a lot at stake. So over time, we've been able to get a lot of information out because when we first started, when we announced that, hey, we're starting an association, we want players to, to come together and stand up, everybody said, you guys are spoiled athletes. <laughs> you know, you should be so happy you have a scholarship. It's like winning the lottery. It's charity. Shut your mouth, put your eyes down, and go do what you're told. And the reality is that we had to break through that. We had to explain, well, no, a full scholarship doesn't even cover the price tag of the school. We're being deceived. You know, we don't, and 85% of us are living before, below the federal poverty line. That's where it left us, a full scholarship. We did a study and we published that. 85% of Division I athletes on full scholarship were living be below the federal poverty line, you know. Um, being stuck with medical bills. Players were dying in workouts. So when you start repeating that um, over time on ESPN and CNN and Fox Sports and the different media outlets, and, and each, each time there was a player to stand up, and you may think about this, you know, um, this is a system, and you guys are both currently playing. Yep. It can be hard, right? I mean, it oh, can yeah. be hard. So um, it's not like waves of players were just – they all wanted it, but it was very few and far between when players stood up. So when I say it wasn't just me, it couldn't have been just me. I, could, I couldn't have done any of this on my own, but – um, what players I knew lacked was just some form of organization, some opportunity at times to get together and keep moments and push forward. So um, with that, there have been um, some pretty good gains and long way to go. Yeah, I mean, you go. guys have probably had a lot of heat, right? I mean, people coming at you guys saying exactly what you were saying, the spoiled or trying to you try to work around that, and people are scared to kind of talk out because they don't want to lose whatever they already have going for them and stuff. How how's that been? Yeah, you know. We kept waiting for a moment where we'd be proven wrong. You know, people were, some people were upset. Some people, a lot of people were envious, right? That's what it, that's where it kind of comes down to. Mm. You're lucky. I put myself through school. Well, college athletes put themselves through school too. And as hard as it is for a regular student, which it is hard, it's really hard for a, a football player or a basketball player or a volleyball player to put themselves through school. You know, so when we talk through these issues, we, you know, we put facts and figures for it. We've done a lot of homework. We've crunched our own numbers. And at this point, there is, how do we deal with it? We actually just tell the truth with facts and figures. Mm -hmm. Really easy to counter, you know, false perceptions or even the industry's misleading assertions when, you, when you're comfortable with the facts. You know, you can go ahead, put, lay your head down at night knowing that you're not lying to anybody, you're not cheating anybody. And, um, and generations of athletes, you know, depend on it. I think, you, what years are you guys? I'm a sophomore. I'm in grad school. So you're in grad school. So, yeah. So... Sorry, Mo. <laughs> You're not going to get much of this, all right? If we, if we really? get this bill passed, it started, no it started in January. It would be effective in January. So it would be oh, after the season. Oh, okay. I so. thought it was a provision where only undergrad gets the money. No, I was no, like, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are just holding back. Yeah. Just not doing school. We, 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 <laughs> grad students? Nah, you can figure I'll it out. I'll take one class. <laughs> yeah, I was like, damn. <laughs> Don't want to graduate. Yeah. yeah. No, but so it starts in January if it, it goes through, through. If saying. it goes through, it would start in January. And but, huge. But this is a thing. You know, I'm talking to both of you. You're on your way out. Uh, you're looking at a system that, it, it, no, no matter what we do right now, likely will not benefit you at all. Yeah. Okay? But you're a teammate here, you know, and, and your other teammates. And you know what? You guys know a lot about football. You got some good genes. You may have a son or, or a daughter coming up with this system. It'll go quicker than you think. You know, and either players would have looked back and said, you know what? I'm glad, you know, whatever I did to help, or I'm glad, you know, these issues went forward or not. But you know, the eligibility goes so fast. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the frustrations I've had is that, you know, it's taken so long. I hate seeing you finishing up your career now without, you know, the things that should have been in place, you know, um, that you deserve as an American citizen. When I say breaking the law, these, these are illegal activities. You yeah. know, um, it violates antitrust law, civil rights law, labor law, you know, but um, for us, it, it, it's been a sprint, you know, in our minds, but we look back and we're, we're like, this is actually a marathon. Yeah. You know? So it's, it gets frustrating, but um, I think especially now it's good to see some, uh, some benefits and protections coming your way. Yeah. Do you think that the NIL um, breakthrough is kind of helping, um, like just people be more open to uh, player rights and kind of allowing players to have more ability to do other, you know? That's a good question. You know, NIL has been amazing. Um, it's been a great, I don't know, campaign to be a part of. Um, so we, that was another California bill. So this flag here, this is... We're trying to change things oh, from yeah. California and yeah. just, you know, it's contagious. It has lead to lead the way, lead the way. Um, but it was interesting because, you know, gosh, if you look at the nation, um, such partisan divide and just 
toxicity, right? And almost every issue you look at. But when it came to NIO, bipartisan support. The bill, really? the bill in California, we got 100%, 100% bipartisan support in California. Wow. There was not one no vote. Really? Yeah. Right? And this is, okay, this is a blue state. Yeah. Then we went to Florida and got all kinds of bipartisan support. That's great. We passed in a red state. Red Nebraska, blue New Jersey. It didn't matter. It yeah. didn't matter. You couldn't tell a Democrat or Republican apart when they were talking about name, image, and likeness. And it felt good to, that there was this overwhelming push for um, player freedoms. But it has to start somewhere. It, it couldn't, I don't think it could have started anywhere. I think it took a state like California that's really going to look at this issue. As a platform. As a platform to yeah. start it. I think a lot of the ripple effect, a lot of that was based in competition. Exactly. Yeah. You, you know, know, think you about it. You can't be behind the ball yeah. um, and something like that. You can't have your schools handcuffed while yeah. California's out there. You know, Making money, giving their players, yeah. No, that's interesting. You mentioned the partisan divide how, with NIL. How does that translate to the new bill with revenue sharing? Because, I mean, obviously, you know, California's a democratic state and, and California is the one who's proposing this uh, new bill. But you'd think like a red state, like as a Republican, it's, it's, you know, smaller government, less regulation, like open market, free market. You would think that's also a Republican you know, trait, something that they would advocate for as well, right? It's the same. From our perspective, when we're, we're, when we're talking to lawmakers, it's the same dynamic. You know, yeah. name, image, likeness, you know, for Democrats, it's like standing up for the little guy kind of a thing, you know, against this big industry. It's unfair. For Republicans, conservatives, it's like, hey, this, this is America. We're supposed to be based on free enterprise. You know, you shouldn't, anybody that has talent yeah. should be able to go make as much money as they can and have every opportunity. Free markets. Free markets. And it's no different when it comes to payment, right? So this illegal collusive price fix right now on players' compensation is un-American. It's the opposite of free enterprise. Sure. The opposite. So the same exact principles apply to yeah. what this California bill represents. Um, and I, th I think it speaks to the core of each party. So. Uh, so far, we'll see what the final votes are um, in each chamber. Yeah. You know, the, with NIL, at first, there were a couple of no votes. People stayed off the bill. They didn't really want to vote against it. They kind of knew that it was credible, but they, didn't, they weren't sure. sure. But when the final votes came in, nobody voted no. I don't mm -hmm. think anybody wanted to stand That's up. That's awesome. That's really interesting to know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, people who are, like, fighting against it or people who are unsure of what, you know, people were thinking during that time, it's very insightful. Yeah, it was, it, like I said, kind of amazing to, to see, um, but this is not an easy bill at all. You know, the schools, I, I lobbied in Congress a lot on these issues and I was told um, early on by multiple offices, they said, you are going up against the most powerful industry, lobbying industry in the nation. They said, most people think it's big pharma or big oil, it is not. It is higher education. Really? Very powerful. All the lawmakers graduated from somewhere they're alumni somewhere. They love going to the games. They love the box seats. They love That's the special right. treatment. Yeah. They don't really want to break cost sports, but they don't know enough about it. I mean, literally, there is a reason why people lobby is because lawmakers can't know everything. And in Congress, they literally have a world of issues, right? So they lean on people who are supposed to be experts. And, you know, the industry, they don't tell the truth, you know? And, sure. and if we allow them to lobby without having a counterweight, then all the lawmakers would believe the, you know, false arguments and, you know, um, for us, again, going out there telling the truth and showing the facts, data, and figures has been powerful. And Congress hasn't really seen that before. So um, it's, it's, it's big. Now, you know, what else? Most people don't know this, too. In California, you wouldn't know it by the way the schools kind of celebrate it now. Mm -hmm. Every school opposed our, our name, image, likeness bill in the state of California. Every single college did not. Really? None of them wanted it. They said the sky would, would fall. They'd have to cancel sports. It would hurt female athletes, they, anything that they thought could stick to the wall. That's sure. interesting, because you'd think it helps the California schools especially, right? Because big markets, LA, USC, UCLA, I think it only helps But it takes schools. away from, I think, the, the people that are running the schools and gives it to the players. Not, no, no, we're talking about NIL. But even NIL, yeah, so, so even. Think, of, think about this. Now, if Nike, prior to July 1st, if Nike wanted a logo on a player's body, who do they pay? Who do they have to pay? The school. The school. Could they pay you? No. No. So in a sense, this monopoly was monopolizing name, image, and likeness value as well yeah. from third parties. So now Nike has an option. Now they might still spend the Continue, same money. Yeah. Or they can reduce it a little bit, give a little bit less to the school, 
and go around to the, the schools. Players. Yeah, exactly. They can go directly to the players now, right? The schools do not want this. And some of the state houses, when we were debating this, the, some of the schools said it openly, we're going to lose money because some of the sponsors are going to pay the players instead of us. Mm. And our counter was, well, that means you're robbing players right yeah. now. Yeah, you're <laughs> you an education system. <laughs> you're, you're, they're there to serve the, the people, you know, help them develop as a person and as – you know, learning and and obviously in the sports world, uh, developing your athletic ability. But I mean, they're there to serve the the players and the people, and so they shouldn't really have a say. You know, in trying to take away from the people. You know, that's how. And that, and that was, I mean, really any kind of common sense debate um, on this issue. The schools just lost. You know, they they couldn't justify it. It just was, and they had the power and they had the might. They opposed it for what you said that they just didn't want to lose it. Not even an ounce of not one penny. They didn't want to lose one penny. Uh, of their uh, monopoly on name, image, likeness. You know, think about this. If you remember, I remember uh, going to autograph signing, especially for bowl games. Right? Oh yeah. You sit there for an hour, hand cramps. You're signing autographs, <laughs> and the school Golly. is selling like. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you're just like, man. You know, break, <laughs> have a break. You're trying to tap out like yeah. water or something. Get a sub. We got a break. <laughs> yeah. So you're signing autographs, and the school in turn goes and fundraises. They make money off of selling these balls and apparel and everything, and. None of the players signing autographs are allowed to get one penny of doing the same thing. They couldn't go auction off their shoes yeah. or even, I think, I, I think one person got in trouble for um, selling their bowl ring one time. I, I didn't I, know you yeah, couldn't sell that. your bowl ring after all these yeah. years. I'm like, wait a minute, they can't sell their own bowl ring? Yeah. It was against name, image, and likeness rules. They kept yeah. that monopoly tight. You know? So this is just about power and money. This is not about doing the right thing in terms of what the industry has done. And it's the same um, when it comes to this bill, actual compensation. You know, I asked if there was a meeting with the lobbyists, all the schools and the representatives, um, with Senator Bradford, uh, off his office. I was on in a Zoom, and you know, you know, one I think actually it was USC's they, lobbyists said, "Well, if this bill passes, we have to cut sports. We don't have any choice." And I said, "Well, first of all, you know, you do have money. You know, yeah. all, every school, you have the richest coach in the nation right yeah. now. It's kind of a hard sell, right? <laughs> it's kind of a hard sell when you're saying we don't have money. We have to cut other sports." Sure. Um, but that was, you know, so I asked him, I said, you know, all of you, I said, are you just against players getting anything at all? Or is this a, an affordability issue that you're claiming? Are you against paying players one penny above what they get? $10, a hundred dollars, a thousand or 10,000 or what, where, where, where yeah, are we where at are you here? drawing the line? Yeah. They refused to answer. It was just crickets, mm. <laughs> you know, because at the end of the day, we've seen this before. I wanted to make sure it was very clear. They don't want players getting any money. It was not an affordability issue. It was a monopoly issue. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what we're up against. So, yeah. again, we have the facts and figures we can show. Um, there's ways to, to do this where you can preserve all sports and, you know, provide fair compensation for, for college athletes. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do with this bill. Now, are there concerns that the disparity in revenue between college football teams, so say SEC teams who may make more than – a smaller FBS or FCS school who can afford to pay players more, that that increases the divide between the two? Or are they planning on standardizing, like, okay, all FBS teams, this is your base salary, or all conference teams within that division get this amount? Or is it different by university? That's a great question. So, you know, what we're hoping, eventually, I think if this California bill passes, there's a very good chance that Congress is going to want to take something up. And our proposal in Congress was actually already introduced by Senators Cory Booker, who played football at Stanford, oh, and Richard wow. Blumenthal. I didn't know you played it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, he played at Stanford, and um, he's been on this issue for a long time. He's great. Okay. So he introduced the College Athletes Bill of Rights, and we helped heavily on the bill. And what that would have done, it would have guaranteed players in a given sport an equal amount of money. So it would, it would have prevent, provided 50% of revenues, right? And that, just to be clear, that's minus the scholarship, because the scholarship is a payment. Right, so we're counting that. We're not trying to get over. We're not trying to get more than 50%. But 50 so that goes into the 50% you're saying? Correct, correct. Okay, in interesting. In terms of the calculation. So really, huh. you're paying your way through college is what you already are paying your way through college. You're just getting shortchanged. So it would give everyone, say all football players in the FBS division would get the same amount of money. It would make sure that it's equal. Now, a state doesn't have that ability really to do that nationwide. Federal. Um, we, we had proposed um, the, the earlier version of this uh, bill with Senator Bradford we had proposed that um, players throughout California in a given sport would get the same amount if they were due, um, if they were sh being shortchanged. But the Senate Education Committee, they actually wanted it a different way. And like I said, we can't control everything. 
So really it will be just based on your school's revenue, period. Mm. Your school's revenue, so players at USC might get paid more or less than players at UCLA. That's gonna affect you know. recruiting a lot, I yeah. bet. Um, so you, you start winning like a team like Alabama or Georgia. Who Alabama just for national. sure makes the most, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, now you're like, you know, I'm just gonna go to Bama because I can make, you know, the most money at least. So, yeah. so what's interesting, and the question is, and that's, that's kind of the question we have, and, and the answer is this. Um, and is that, in the O'Bannon case, as I mentioned, Ed O'Bannon versus the NCAA, it was an antitrust lawsuit. The school said, oh, you know, anything will ruin competitive equity. NIL, even, will just ruin competitive equity for the same reason, right? And after six years of deliberation and all the expert testimony, the court concluded that even under restrictive NCAA rules, there is no competitive equity. The yeah. first school you mentioned was who? Alabama. <laughs> So what if Alabama got the best recruits? Is that what yeah. you're asking? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they already did. <laughs> what if they won the Natty every yeah. year? <laughs> so, and, and USC. Now look, sure. and I'm a Bruin, right? Yeah. And I looked and saw Lincoln Riley go to your school, and I thought, huh, you know, it seems like a competitive, they're, they're doing this because they want a competitive advantage. He's one yeah. of the most sought-after coaches. They're paying him the most in the nation now. Uh, Caleb came right over, right? So yep. um, there is no competitive equity, right? And so our argument the whole time, and, and even no one's capping coaches' salaries, right? True. Um, UCLA and Cal, their football coaches make about $4 million. Lincoln Riley's getting about $11 million, Yeah. almost three times as much, okay? So uh, if there's all kinds of inequity pouring out of the system and all we're doing is stopping pay to players, you're not doing anything to stop competitive, competitive inequities. Now, if you cap coaches' salaries all at the same amount where San Diego State could hire the same caliber of coach, that USC can hire, right? If you prohibit booster payments, what do boosters do? They boost, yeah. right? They, they want recruits, yeah, right? Exactly. So they can't pay the recruits. They haven't been able to pay the recruits directly. So over all these years, USC, I can probably guarantee you, has had more booster support than Fresno State. Sure. But you're sure. in the same FBS division. Is that fair? Is that, is that, is that competitive? Yeah. <laughs> you know, are you, is USC losing re recruits to San Jose State because uh, things are fair? No, exactly. Uh, in Congress, I, when I testified, um, I had the stats at the time: Ohio State versus Ohio University. Mm -hmm. They're both in the FBS division. <laughs> yeah. Well, guess what those revenues are, <laughs> were in comparison? <laughs> a I mean, lot different. <laughs> it was a whole so Ohio State yeah. at the time was two hundred twenty-five million yeah. in revenue, and Ohio University in the same division about thirty million. Yeah. Thirty. Crazy. So here's the thing: uh, college, from our perspective, college athletes should not be denied a stitch, not one penny in value, not one protection just so the industry can pretend that competitive equity exists, mm. period. Now, if it opens things up and USC actually ends up paying more than any other Pac-12 school just because of the formula and you have an advantage, then so be it. Look at your coach. Yeah. Yeah. You're already banking on an advantage with that. That's, That's a heavy true. investment, right? Yeah. And NIL now. And NIL. The boosters as well. It's almost, I mean, it's not supposed to be pay to play, but it has essentially become that if we're being serious. Like yeah. um, back home in Miami, have you seen um, the Life Wallet guy, Ruiz? He's this billionaire. Right. So right. he's basically fun. He's paying all yeah. these dudes, and um, the one of the top guards uh, that led them to the Elite Eleven, number two, I forgot Wong, I think his last name, but he went off, and then he's like, "All right," um, and he his agent or his manager, right, publicly stated this on Twitter. I saw it this morning. He goes, "All right, I'm either going in the portal or Miami needs to up my NIL money." <laughs> literally I mean, like you could look it up that's yeah, yeah. almost word for word what it said and they're like well that's not legal but i mean it's essentially what i'm saying where they're disguising the pay to play with nil and right. I mean, everyone knows that. i mean one, one of our goals is to get college athletes every ounce of money they can get and this is a free market right i don't know if it's exactly it, it, whether or not it's illegal depends on florida's law and that uh, would take a deep dive. okay no that is so it is against Florida law. I saw that. It is against Florida law? Yeah. Okay. So How is it in California? I'm not sure. California. Um, so in California, there's no rule against USC directly paying you NIO money. Really? There's not, a, there's not a law against it. Huh. Nope. Not a law against That's it. That's interesting. And we fought for that. They almost put it in. Good to we, know. And we, <laughs> yeah. and we almost backed out of supporting the bill at the time. Yeah. 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 You know USC, <laughs> if they wanted to, pack, you know, Pac-12 schools, any, any school in California can directly pay you for your NIO. Right now, they're getting it for free. Yeah. Right? They're getting yeah. your NIL for free. Everybody else has to pay, or you would want them to pay, right? Um, but right now they're getting it for free, and they're getting all the value for free. So whether or not you know, um, it's quote-unquote pay for play or not, how is what uh, Wong is doing at Miami any different than what Lincoln Riley just did?
because if Oklahoma would have countered with 20 million a year, he might still be at Oklahoma, mm. right? So like there's, this, there's kind of like this double standard that just has been such ingrained in our psyche and in American yeah. culture here, where coach, they all have agents, they can go and negotiate any deal, and they will skip, even in the middle of a season, they will skip to another school, yeah. right? Um, and there's not much of a fuss. No one's trying to go to Congress about that and stop that, right? Sure. But when it comes to the players, people get outraged. Some people are getting outraged. And, you know, we're not condoning breaking any laws. And some of the stuff is you need a lawyer to figure out if some of these laws are being broken, honestly, right? Um, so we're not, we're not pushing for that. We're pushing for laws that are free. You know, what we sure. told Florida was like, don't prohibit all this stuff. You're prohibiting they, at, at the time. I, I, I don't think it's been re, um, revised. But in Florida, boosters can't in, get involved with NIL deals. You're not supposed to. Yeah. Right? Now, is it being enforced? Is the attorney general going to go after, you know, these school, their own schools? You know, when the schools are competing against other people? Maybe yeah. not. But um, it may or may not be against the law, you know, in terms of what people are doing. But from our perspective, we, we want to celebrate you know, any, any dollar that goes to a player that's not illegal, right, and um, encourage the system to treat players more fairly. Sometimes it's whacking things down, and it's harder to um, build it up. Like with, you know, we, you know in, the, in the Supreme Court, you know, we won a Supreme Court ruling, and that was actually the reason why the NSA completely backed off of trying to um, regulate NIL. They were going to. They were going to have heavily restrict it in, in the, for athletes who didn't have laws in their states. Mm. But if days before we won 9-0, a 9-0 decision in the Supreme Court, saying, hey, you, you don't have an exemption. You're not, you can't function as a legal monopoly. You can't price fix athlete compensation. And they ruled against the NCAA. So the NCAA said, well, I guess we can't regulate NIL either. You know? yeah. um, it would take Congress to make things more uniform, um, which may, it may come. We'll see. I think it's interesting how you brought up how coaches are treated differently than players. I think for a long time, the societal norm was like a player is like a young kid and like a coach is like he's a lot, he's an adult, he's gone through different things and so his money situation is different. But I think the way with social media nowadays and people are growing up at a, yo a lot younger age. I mean, guys like on our team, 19, 18 years old, making this type of money through NIL. I mean, they're millionaires at 19 years old. Like if, if they don't know what they're going to do at 19, I don't think they're going to know at 21 with the, uh, with the same amount of money, you know? So I think with the societal uh, ability for people to just grow up a lot younger, um, I think it, you can be treated the same way as a coach, especially when these coaches are 30 years old. Like uh, Sean McVay is yeah. a head Some coach for the Rams. Really is You know, he's yeah. super young compared to these kids you yeah. know, who are 20 years old, 24 in grad school or whatever yeah. they're playing. Well, in basketball, too, you can declare after a year. Yeah. So you can be 18 or 19, you know? Yeah, so. absolutely. I mean, they're... The, the arguments you hear, oh, they're going to go waste their money. Okay, do we require coaches to be good with their money before we give them a huge <laughs> yeah. contract? Why is there this double standard, right? Yeah. You, you're 18 years old. Legally, you are an adult. Mm. You know? And even if you're 17, you know, there's, you know, what about the children who are in movies? Is it, do yeah. we keep them away from the money? You know, what about the Williams sisters when they were younger? Do we keep them away from the money? It's this, I, actually, one of the things um, that came up, in NIL that I reflected on was when I was in third grade, I went to a birthday party overnight with one of my good friends. His name was Phil Olsen, okay? Phil Olsen was in fourth grade. <laughs> Phil Olsen had this BMX bike that was so tricked out. It, it looked like a spaceship. I didn't even know what, I was like, is that a bike? What That's is hard. this, right? Yeah. And he's like, yeah, you know, I'm sponsored by BMX and they do this and that mm -hmm. or whatever. And I'm like, what does that mean? Yeah. Sponsored by BMX, he's like, yeah. And he started doing these crazy tricks. I'm like, okay, I can see why. <laughs> Whatever sponsor you got it. <laughs> in the fourth grade, <laughs> fourth grade, he was Jeez, sponsored by BMX, wow. right? Christ. And and every time people say, well, you're too young, or you know, whatever the the excuse is when it has to do with age, I think back to Philip Olsen. Yeah. <laughs> and like, well, how come there's no outrage? He was good, you know, yeah. at four. Yeah. Fourth grade. Yeah. That's awesome. Alex, you had some. Yeah. So I guess my question would be, because uh, I don't know if this is all new information to you guys. It's definitely the first I'm hearing about this. If I'm an athlete, not to say I'm not, but if I were a collegiate <laughs> athlete, uh, where do I go to get access to this information and to become aware? Because I'm assuming this isn't something exactly the school necessarily wants me to know, but also would provide the information for me to know. So one of the most difficult things to do is to keep athletes informed, get them informed and keep them informed. I mean, they're coming, the, the turnover rate is crazy. Um, for us, we have a newsletter that goes out, so if players want to, uh, get more information. They can sign up um, on our website, you know, 
and, and we'll put that in the all the YouTube. Uh, it's a newsletter that you write. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Myself, or sometimes we have other people write it, but we put it out, and it will. It's it, it's kind of an education. It's like a, you know, it's hard to slam everybody with everything they need to know, but in bite sized sure. pieces. Yeah. Um, and especially incoming freshmen each and every year, but. Yeah, the schools don't want you to know this information. They don't want the public to know this information. So sure. they're going to be the last people to tell you about it. Um, so yeah, that's that's how we that's we that's our attempt at getting players informed. Um, but it is it is a challenge. Yeah, I mean, I could definitely see we have to do so many types of like um, meetings or like informative uh, what you call them, workshops um, every year for all different topics. I mean, it could be from like sexual assault to diversity and inclusion. I mean, we do. Um, things about alcohol and I mean going out and doing that type of stuff um, and like they could include like just have a workshop where the, the all the athletes are required to go that teaches them you know what their rights are and what they uh, you know are granted as a citizen in America and for their school or whatever I mean that would be huge that would you know we in the in the College Athletes Bill of Rights that would be a, a requirement because it is the schools are a bottleneck you guys have meetings all the time on, <laughs> on things um, but you don't know your rights yeah you know you don't know the rights especially um, when your rights bump up against the industry's interests, that's the last thing you're going to find out about, unless it's a requirement legally. All right, here's my question. NCAA gotcha. video game. <laughs> <laughs> when are we getting it back? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so EA Sports, the game they've announced, college football is coming back. They announced that uh, in the spring of last year, which we were pretty excited about. There was one red flag, though, because in the announcement, they said they, would, they weren't going to be including players or paying the players. Sure. So, but that was uh, several months before NIL was official. Yeah. So um, we we expect um, the players will be included and will be pay paid appropriately. So I think there'll be some some news likely coming up to, really? to that effect. But will it be like Madden, the same business model where how they distribute well, the revenue? Or? Um, I don't I don't know I don't know. It'll be you know I think details would would probably come out down the line. Um, but EA Sports, everybody loves the games. I think guys just want to play it. Yeah. Like, I don't even know. If you we, can play we, with yourself. We I need mean, that's the money. Pretty. It's just like, give us a free copy at this point. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> let's get this thing rolling. We, we right? play with myself for 12 hours yeah. in the game. Yeah. Yeah. I, in full disclosure, so I was an advisor. That was from the O'Bannon lawsuit. Okay. Ed O'Bannon sued the NCAA and EA Sports because he was in the college basketball game. Yeah. Years after he was being, he was done playing. Sure. And he was still being sold in the game. But wasn't making. <laughs> wasn't making a penny. Yeah. You know, and, and that was wrong. And really, the sports model before, it was exploitative. OK, um, EA Sports, um, they would have been fine paying the players. The NCAA said no. And so EA either had to walk away or play by the NCAA's rules. It's kind yeah. of what it was. Um, but those rules are being deemed illegal, right? They were, it was illegally exploiting college athletes. So you know, um, it's taken a while, unfortunately. But I think it's going to be um, really refreshing and good to see it come back and, and come back the right way, come back the right way. I hope so, because I still have my Xbox 360 from, like, 10 <laughs> years ago, and I update the rosters every few months, and that's it's not <laughs> going to cut it. Get, yeah. yeah, but it's starting to glitch, though, because it's so old. <laughs> we got to so. take care of that. Yeah. I just want to say, as a Bruin fan, video games probably the only way you're going to see your team whoop USC in the next decade. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to ask you a Wait, did you just say you were a Bruin fan? <laughs> no, I said you as no, a Bruin fan. No, no, no. Please, please, please. No, no, no. You said as a Bruin fan. Yeah, no, it's a fun rivalry. It's always been great. Um, That's awesome. It, and you know what? You know, this year we saw all these people who said they'd walk away if a player got a dollar. They didn't walk away. TV ratings were just fine. Right? Yeah. So yeah, that's another lie that the industry has told. Um, at the end of the day, USC fans are going to watch USC. UCLA fans are going to watch UCLA. doesn't matter how much money you two have in your pocket or not. Now, 10 years from now, where do you see the NCAA as it currently stands, or if it stands at all. And, like, what would you propose, say, like, I gave you, Ramogi, full reins to do as you like with amateur or, like, college sports. Like, how, how do you envision the, the model? So in terms of, you know, the fix, I, I would just say this in terms of, in reality, if there's going to be a uniform fix or some kind of real solution, um, it's going to come from Congress. So what I'll say is that it's going to reflect what we've been, been already fighting for, um, really, it's fine to have the NCAA. It's fine to have Division One and Division Two and Division Three. Those things are fine. Um, but first and foremost, top priority, health and safety needs to be enforced. Um, and it needs to be from a third party. It needs to be a government organization that players can call 
when there's violations of health and safety standards because this industry creates the health and safety violations and the players have nowhere to go. You know, the schools sweep things under the rug too often. And the NCAA has refused to enforce anything. So in terms of health and safety, that would be the answer. In terms of um, player compensation, 50% of revenues, you know, should be going to the players. And, and I would put it to where players throughout a division get an equal amount. They all get an equal amount. Um, when it comes to uh, preserving sports, this is a $15 billion a year industry that enjoys revenues tax-free mm-hmm. because of their educational mission, right? Yeah. Well, doesn't it undermine your educational mission when you're cutting sports, when you're taking scholarships away, right? These schools that suddenly announce, oh, we're dropping these sports and teams, and they're paying their football coach $2 million, right? It wasn't a necessity. It was a preference. So to me, that tax exemption should be conditional upon preserving all sports, Mm. Um, because really that's the only thing that speaks to education in this whole entire business yeah. is the opportunities for education and the scholarships to support those opportunities. Um, and also we would put teeth in Title IX. Right now it's really not being enforced. Um, USA Today did a, a, a pivotal study, 70, 71 cents to the dollar in terms of spending on women's sports versus men's sports in Division I. Um, this is the 50th year anniversary of Title IX, mm-hmm. completely unacceptable. And it's just a reflection of the ADs, their preferences, for not being held accountable for breaking federal law. Um, so that should change. So I think those are some of the tenants. Um, as well as, you know, sports-related medical expenses, players should be stuck with sports-related medical bills, especially in Division I. Um, so I think those things can really fix a lot of what's wrong in college sports. Um, but the NCAA has been not just, you know, re- you know, reactive, just late to the game, just – really stubborn. They don't want to do any of it because, again, it's, it's really based in greed. They can do these things, but they won't. Um, and we're not pointing to Indianapolis. We're pointing to the collective will of the schools. That's who passes NCAA rules, that they collectively decide that this is a system that they're fighting for. So when they push, if they're pushing Mark Emmert out as NCAA president, it's their system, and he has no power, actually. Yeah. He, has, he doesn't even have a vote, by the way. The NCAA president has zero power, no really? vote. He's just a figurehead. And the real power comes within the voting blocks of these schools. So, you know, I, I personally wouldn't uh, like to see the Power Five break away. The only reason why they're going to break away or consider breaking away, it's all about money and power. Yeah. That's it. It has nothing to do with um, whether or not it's good for college athletes, college sports. They just want to uh, maximize more money. And that's pretty much it. They don't really want to share in any way. Um, but I think that structure... It's not a necessity. That's their preference. So mm-hmm. if I had it my way, I'd keep it together um, and, and pay players even within the division and, and, and within each respective sport mm-hmm. if they um, were being shortchanged. That's surprising. I thought you were going to do away with the NCAA. At the end of the day, you're going to have to have some kind of administration. Yeah. You're going to have to have some kind of governance. So, um, you know, who's going to manage the Power Five? If they break away, how does that get managed? How- some new governing and ent- like governing body. Yeah. I was listening to... Uh, Mark Cuban this morning talking about like a potential for some loose affiliation with the schools, but you essentially professionalize the teams themselves, like in some maybe distant future where say like USC has a professional football team, but we represent the Trojans on the field, but we're professionals, you know. I think that misses the mark a bit because the thing that's special about college sports is that the players are actually college students. I think they got that right, Mm. you know, and the more you, you remove that, then um, I think the fan bases will, you know, kind of actually go down a bit. The spirit goes down. A bit. And there's no reason to do that. There's plenty of money. Yeah. There's plenty of money in it. Um, and it's not, um, you know, education is not a bad thing. Um, so I, I would, I would like to see the things I said change. I think it's great that college athletes are still in school. I would like to see them have to do less of school, during, especially during the season. You know, the Pac-12, they, they released a survey of, of athletes that said they, they spend 50 hours a week in their sport alone. Yeah. You know, um, but then you expect them to be full-time students. And you expect them to get a quality degree and major in what they want to major in. Mm-hmm. No, they need more time to graduate. So maybe during the season, instead of a full load, maybe it's half for that part. And it might take a little, maybe a little longer to graduate. Does it affect um, eligibility then? It sh- I don't think it should. Okay. You know, that's so these still four years of play? It should be. But right now it would. If you're not, if you're not enrolled full-time, um, then you're not eligible. Yeah. And that's, that's a structural barrier to completing a degree, to having a quality degree quality degree, majoring in what you want to major in, you know, um, regular students, um, and yeah, many of them, it's, it's really difficult for them 
to get through school. But I, th I would say few of them are working 50 hours a week and going to school full time. You know, and regular students are actually more academically prepared on average. That's, you have to admit that, right? I mean, yeah. a lot of players get um, admitted entry admission to schools and they're less academically prepared, yet you pile on 50 hours of sports when you're talking about travel and everything else yeah. in their sport. And, and we're going to pretend that, that that's a, a great path towards education. Um, we looked at the graduation rates uh, here in California and we're kind of getting the lawmakers uh, aware of what's really going on, you know, and when you look at the racial breakdown, I mean, these are, there's only three predominantly black sports and that's football, men's basketball, women's basketball. Mm. Um, and those happen to be the primary revenue generators. Um, the schools are heavily recruiting out of uh, low income black com communities, promising an education. Um, but again, when you put those dynamics together, graduation rates for FBS uh, football players who are black is about 62%. Uh, for men's basketball players who are black, it's like 42%. Mm. And there are five schools, uh, Division I basketball teams, whose black athletes have a 0% graduation rate. Jeez. But they produce 100% of the value for those teams, right? Yeah. And it's not like the schools are bending over backwards, making sure that they can complete their degrees. Obviously, 0% graduation rate. Yeah. So let's not pretend that this is a fair and equitable system that's really linked to graduation. Um, the bill, that, uh, uh, Senator Bradford's bill, would actually make most of it conditional upon completing your degree. Now you take money and you align it with something that's educational, you know, so the players um, can do everything they can to fight upstream mm -hmm. and actually complete their degree instead of just looking at the league thinking, oh, I'm going to make it when only 2% make it. 100%. So you only get the money if you exactly. complete your degree? If um, you get up to 25000 a year immediately, the rest is conditional upon degree completion okay. within six years. Okay. Oh, interesting. I what? forgot to mention that. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And what, what have you guys calculated is the worth in, say, well, open market maybe is not the right term, but say USC, for example, what, like what numbers are we talking as far as like how much we would make? Um, with the new calculations, because the Senate education, um, I'm not exactly sure, but it likely it could be easily be $100,000 on top of the scholarship per, per player per year. Per year? Yes. Wow. And, and one of the points that we made is that um, again, this value is otherwise going into coaches' salaries and facilities and everything else what it normally goes into. Um, but this is like a true potential for a shift in generational wealth. As I mentioned, a lot of athletes are from low-income families, right? Yeah. Many of them never w really even went to college. Um, home ownership, for example, in the black community, even among college grads, is extremely low, mm. extremely low. So this could affect um, you know, some of these players generationally. We're now... Coming out of college, they have a down payment for a home. You know, they have uh, money to start a small business. Yeah. They, they can do things investment-wise instead of um, really having zero dollars or being in debt, you know, from medical, even medical expenses. 50% of Division I athletes end up with chronic medical expenses uh, from college sports-related injuries and have n really not much support at all from the school. Most have none, no support at all from the school. So wow. um, money's important, as we mentioned. Why is every other student in, in college? Degree, uh, make money. job, and to make money. Money is not evil. It's a necessity. And um, it's better to have. I think the average American would hope that they would have more money than less money. How would, um, how would that bill work with sports who aren't on full scholarship? So I know a lot of sports are like partial scholarship or 25%. How does that affect it? It would still be the same calculation. So at, let's just say women's tennis at USC, uh, in aggregate. Let's just say they produced... $500,000 a year in revenue, and the scholarships ended up being, it'd be a lot more than say USC, but you know, they receive $250,000 a year in revenue. Then they get 50%, right? They, they're getting their scholarships paid for, and that equates to 250000 so they're getting 50%. If they're only getting 150000 then that, re that shortfall of 100000 will be evenly divided among the, among the athletes on that team. Okay. And would the best players on said football team be given more money, say like a star quarterback or, you know, they would first round athlete, it would just be evenly? It would be even. Okay. And that's kind of reflective of what goes on in college already. You know, right yeah. now the starting quarterback gets what the third string defensive lineman okay. gets in terms of a scholarship. So college model is different than the pros in a that's sense. True. So we just kind of, you know, we're fully supportive of that. And yeah. most players are pretty okay with that. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I think we've gotten a lot of information, you know.
Yeah, thanks for joining yeah. us, man. Yeah, happy to be that here. That was awesome. No, was super cool. Uh, happy I to hope be we here. got paid. I'll say yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, could I ask one more quick question just to end it yeah, on? Yeah, like okay. a, yeah. uh, one little light. Not light, but just a little half. Not half. I don't know. Light or not. <laughs> I was just to say the question. <laughs> do you have any time at UCLA? We won't talk about it too much. But do you have any, like, cool stories that you remember just come off the top of your head from your time playing SE? I mean, it's, sometimes it's the little things, right? So um, I played uh, at UCLA. One of my best friends played for USC. He's Dalen McCutcheon, one of, one of really good, really good um, DBs. We played together at Bishop Amat High School. Um, so we went our separate race, so it was a kind of a crosstown rivalry. And I remember it was a punt. I think I was on the punt team, and his, and his roommates, him and his roommates were on the punt return team. And me and my roommates were on the same half of the field on the punt team. And uh, we start talking a little smack, laughing. <laughs> there, so it's just those things, honestly. It's, it's the little stuff for me. That's awesome. But That's yeah, the other thing is that we never lost to USC. What over four? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now that goes out over four years. Over eight years, but I was there five of the five of those. Four but you guys I was won eight years. straight years. Won eight straight. Whoa. Yeah. That was so, nineties. Yeah, that was the nineties. The last in that streak. I didn't know there was a streak, run like that. Um, Ninety-eight was the last. I think that was the eighth. I think we lost. I wasn't on the team when we lost in 99. Wow. You guys were, <laughs> like, I wasn't there. I wasn't there. <laughs> I wasn't there in 99. But you guys yeah. had some good teams over that period? We did. We did. We, um, we finished number five in the nation twice. My okay. last two seasons, we won the Pac-10. That's how old I am. Crazy. Pac-10 twice um, the last two years. So, huh. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was experiences. Yeah, it was really cool. It was really cool. Awesome. Well, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, where can people reach you? You're not on, like, Instagram and Twitter, are you? Um, the NCPA is, um, so okay. you can find in the NCPA. I personally am not, actually. Yeah, yeah. I, I try to. Stay you should. Away. What's the NCPA? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So at, at NCPA now is, is, uh, is the handle. So. Awesome. Yeah, a lot of Twitter, especially, we, we put out, you know, you would hear about the bill and some of the details. Um, even Facebook, I know that's probably for more of the <laughs> alums. Not too many young people on Facebook. So yeah, uh, and then have and you considered like creating a Twitter account and being active on there? I think it'd actually be really useful. Myself, I have. I was on social media f for a long time, um, and I actually, I, 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 it's hard to like drop my phone. So for me, I thought, well, you know what? Um, I have two boys now, so yeah, I don't want them growing up with me looking at my phone. Sure. Yeah. So um, you know, it's it's more business. It's more the NCPA. Yeah. I feel that. So, okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, to be contacted, info at ncpanow.org. <laughs> Um, you know, just, just, just hit us up, hit us up. You have questions, want to help, uh, especially athletes, you know, um, definitely love yeah. talking to players, getting them informed and, um, being a resource yeah. for sure. That's absolutely, awesome. absolutely. A lot of times also too, sometimes athletes, you know, they get stuck with medical bills or, you know, they're being abused or mistreated at their schools. Um, so we, we've helped a lot in those areas as well. Awesome. Oh yeah. Thanks for coming on Ramogi. You're the man. Appreciate you, bro. This is awesome. Cool. Yeah.